Hello everyone, welcome to Computer Science E1. So it wouldn't actually be E1 unless we didn't have some technical difficulties and so it seems we can't actually connect our computers so we have to sort of wing this now even more than usual and what you're seeing is a uh, projection off of the Podium PC and so us being Mac people um, and as you can tell I actually, my Mac broke and I had to use a PC so I'm, I'm sort of relieved now about this. Um, but anyway, us being Mac people, we now have to switch to a PC. So there's going to be even more awkwardness than usual in this particular lecture. Now, um, my Vanna White of a co-presenter, David Malin over here, is actually uh, has brought up very kindly for us the ComputerScience1.net website, on which you will find a collection of very useful materials for your upcoming exam. So hopefully you've marked on your calendar that next week we will have our first of two exams, and this exam is comprehensive, so expect all of the material, including today's lecture material, to be covered on it. After lecture, in the, uh, the section, um, we will actually also have uh, uh, an exam review, which will uh, be useful, and we also expect that to be taped and posted online as well. However, there is a little bit of a delay, so in the meantime, you might find these particular materials to be quite useful. How about assignment four, Dan? How about assignment four? Is it up yet? <laughs> no, assignment four, because we have two lectures on the internet, assignment four will be posted uh, by tomorrow. It will be very similar to assignment two, which you may recall had two parts, the blog and the wiki. So again, you'll be challenged with uh, presenting a, an article on some topic pertaining to the internet, as well as a blog post pertaining to the same. Uh, in answer to uh, FAQ that we've gotten over email, how assignments and such are graded, for the most part, the assignments are check, check, plus, check, minus, and we'll soon make available online in some form or via email just a record uh, of when or how or that you submitted those assignments. The exams, meanwhile, will be graded on a more typical percentage scale. And so that, again, is on Monday. OK. So switching back to the actual lecture topic, so the internet. So as you can tell, we have loaded up a web page on this uh, projection. And when I typed in the, um, the address, computerscience1.net, and hit return, you might recall from last week, that some things happened. What, what happened? What are some of the things that we learned about last week that made this website appear on this computer screen? So I type in computerscience1.net. I hit enter. What's the first thing that we have to be able to do? Right, find the numbers. So we have to be able to determine what the IP address is. So just like uh, a phone book, you might know the name of a company, or in this case, the name of a website, and you have to look up the address of where you can contact that website or where you can contact this company to be able to contact it, request the information. In this case, we're requesting the web page and be able to retrieve it from that particular person. So we're using this system called DNS to be able to look up based on the, um, the host name or the, the URL or the address, in other words, at the very top, what the IP address of this particular machine is. Then we send a request along, and that's when we use these things called routers, where, where our request is routed from one router to the next, to the next, to the next, eventually finding its way to the server, or in this case, where, where this website is actually residing. And then the server finds out, OK, well, they want to get the website at computerscience1.net. So then it returns back to us through the, through the various routers along the internet the contents of this web page. And so this is a very, very general overview about what happens. And you might recall that one of the most important things about um, using the internet on, or using the internet in general, is that we have to be able to find out what the IP address of particular machines are. And if your machine is on the internet, you have an IP address. And so in this case, this machine is on the internet, and it has an IP address of its own. And so you then uh, will be able to send a request outward, so to some, to say computerscience1.net, and it will know then the return address of where it should send that data back. And so all of these routers along the way can say, OK, well, IP addresses in this range should go along this path, and IP addresses of this range should go along this path, and along this range go along this path, until eventually, through one router after another, your message is actually received. Now, one of the things that um, the creators, so to speak, of the internet did very, very first thing was realize that the connection between routers or even the connection between a router and your computer may not be the most reliable. And there's some ways that they try to mitigate this problem. And obviously, there's still problems despite some of these, uh, some of these niceties that we have built in. But 
there would be a lot more problems if there wasn't this additional layer of, it's not, not security, but this additional layer of, of protection, so to speak, of, of allowing, of ensuring that your data gets sent from one place to another. And specifically, what can happen is you might have a message that you have to send to some computer. So in this case, when we contact computerscience1.net, we ask it to send us the web page for that. And that is a message, say, give us the web page. But this message doesn't get sent as a whole. It doesn't get sent as that entire message along the internet, just like this web page isn't sent back to us as the web page in a whole. What we see at the end is a recombined version of a message that's been split into various what are called packets. And these packets, if you might recall from the video last week, are, are what is actually sent from one computer to the next, along the wire, through routers, et cetera. So to give you an idea of what this is, I actually wrote a message on a piece of paper, and I'm not going to turn this around because it, I have a secret message that I'm going to be sending someone. So I need a volunteer, someone in the back. You don't have to stand up. I just need your first name. That's all I need. Somebody, so please, somebody in the back, just raise your hand and say your name. It can be a fake name, as long as it's not obviously <laughs> fake. OK, yes? Mark. I'm sorry? Mark. Mark, OK. So Mark, I'm going to send you a message. So you don't not necessarily know that, except that I said that. But assume that I am a computer, and that I'm going to be sending Mark over there a message. So I've already looked up his IP address. And what I'm going to do is write on an envelope, basically, or I'm going to create a packet that's going to allow me to send Mark a message. And so I did all the work already. I had a message on a piece of paper, and I tore it up into several different packets. And now what I'm going to do is put the message into each packet, address it to Mark, and send it along its way. So what are some of the things that you imagine that I might need to know that I might need to put on this packet in order for it to work properly, for this, this whole scenario to work. So, OK, yeah, so how to spell Mark. But I assume that I already know his, his address, so to speak, his address, quote unquote. So what other information might I need to know on this packet? Um, where it's coming from. Right, exactly. So a return address. So I'm going to say it's from Dan. I forgot to write from before. And did I hear something else as well? Another idea? The order, exactly. So what can happen is that you're not guaranteed when you send packets out along the internet that they will be received in the exact same order that they were sent. Maybe, it's, maybe one packet is, is sent to a router that's taking a long time to send it along you know, its proper route. Or maybe they get split, and then some take a longer path than others, and so on and so forth. So you might actually get them not in the proper arrangement of 1, 2, 3, 4, but maybe it's going to be like 2, 1, 4, 3, or something like that. And if you recombine it without knowing the order, it's not going to make a lot of sense. So that's what I have on each of these packets. I have four packets here. I have a two address. I have, um, I have it divided down. I'm saying it's part one of four. And then I have a from address, or in this case, it's from. So what I'm going to do now is distribute these packets to routers. And each of these routers are, are you. And you, being routers, will have to try to get these packets back to Mark, as you know, is in the, is in the back. So here is. Well, just do whatever you want. Just send it. You, know, you should trust other routers to be able to send it to the proper direction. Last one. OK, so that one right there, that packet. So right, so yeah, Alex. Alex, do me a favor. Tear up that packet. So Alex is a bad router, and he's dropped my <laughs> packet. Well, OK, so he tore it up. But in, in usually what it's called is they, they drop a packet. Or it's, just, it's just lost in the internet. So we don't know which one that is. Or I don't know anything about this. Because now it's I'm, you know, me being a computer, I, I just send it out along to the first router. And I just am hoping that my packets make it there. So Mark, did you get some of the packets? So which one is missing? Uh, part one. Part one, OK. So now I have to. Take, I have to redesign. So what happens is that Mark responds and says, OK, I didn't receive this packet within a certain time frame. And so I'm going to assume that it's lost. So me actually wanting to get a, re a message will go ahead and recreate that one particular packet. This is very hands-on here. So to Mark, 
part one of four, and it's from Dan. All right, now I will send it again, and don't tear this one up because I'm out of envelopes. So just send it now in the most optimal path. So now my packets are getting sent from my computer over to Mark. And hopefully Mark will then be able to recombine the message and tell us what it says. And, and don't hold your breath. It's not particularly creative. Uh, last week I was trying to figure out in the middle of lecture while David was blabbing, oh, maybe I should actually come up with a message to write in this example. And uh, so I wrote a four-word message, whatever I could come up with. And hopefully Mark will soon have a message so I don't have to keep blabbing about this uh, embarrassing story. So. Sorry, I didn't get John this first. That's the wrong story. So the message says. Message received. Woohoo. <laughs> so, yeah, that's actually out of order. It should have been woohoo, message received. Um, so it looks like um, the packets. <laughs> either through uh, the sender or through the receiver got mixed up in some way. So that's basically what happened. So on Mark's end, he's, he's able to receive all of the packets, figure out the order, recombine them, and then know what the full length message was. And so we can send very lengthy messages over the internet just by splitting them up into packets. And this is invisible to us. Our network cards, the, where we connect our ethernet port, or our ethernet cords, or our Wi-Fi cards actually do all of this work for us and just send to the, to, to the rest of the computer and to our eyes the final message that we can actually receive. So the very first step in this process, as Stan noted, and as you may recall from last week, is that DNS lookup to actually find Mark's IP address. If all, if he knew, all, if all, of, all Dan knew uh, a priori was Mark or Mark.com. So there's these things called DNS servers out there. And recall that we briefly said last week that there's been this hijacking of late in recent years, recent months, by ISPs and other entities that do what exactly? What was this context of hijacking DNS lookups? Yeah. Exactly. So the, t the expected behavior for web browsers for years, and according to the specifications of all these technologies, is if that you type jerk, 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 jerk com, which was the random example I came up with last week, and no one has yet bought that domain, what you should get is some kind of error screen or just a big white screen in your browser, and you might get something like cannot find server, something to that effect. A little cryptic, but at least succinct and clear. You don't see what, typically. You shouldn't see what. So you shouldn't see a page by nature, and you probably weren't expecting to see a page filled with advertisements. But Comcast is one, among the offenders of this, and I thought I'd bring up on the tail end of Dan's story here about TCP IP and DNS precisely what happened to me on Saturday. I very recently got, oh, my new cable modem arrived, uh, incidentally, just to tie up that loose end from last week. This is the Extreme 50 service, which was important to me, not so much for the download speed recall, but for the upload speed. But when I received this modem, plugged it into my wall, activated it with Comcast, the thing is, something about it is different from my old cable modem, and that's its unique address called an Ethernet address or a MAC address, which Dan explained last week is capital M-A-C, Media Access Control. Well, there's that same ringer again. <laughs> um, so this, this uh, cable modem has a different MAC address, and the result of this is that Comcast essentially opted me back into their stupid DNS uh, or domain helper service, such that the first time I made a typo this weekend with my new cable modem, I was led not to some white, uh, fairly technical screen saying server not found, but rather this. And this is an example, actually not this, I wasn't searching for Yahoo, but this is a screenshot someone else took that recreates precisely what my experience was. What's the typo this particular person seems to have made? Yeah, so they got the dot wrong. So they have www.yahoo.com, which is not a valid domain name or not a valid uh, website. And so they got plastered with these ads from Comcast. Now, this wasn't so bad at first glance, because if you look in the top right-hand corner, it's a little small here. It says up top, disable the service. And so I clicked through to this page. And I was then led to Comcast.com, their customer central, where I'm supposed to log in, frankly, with the username and password I haven't used in like five years, because I never have need to log into this site. I finally figured it out, logged in, and precisely on the home page of theirs, where I'm supposed to see the opt-out link, there's instead another 
a bubble that says sign in here. Apparently, I've had a Comcast service for so long that I somehow along the way got two usernames, and they want me to now synchronize the accounts. Anyhow, long story short, I myself had one of these nightmarish customer service fiascos this weekend that to date is still not actually resolved. I am still opted into this particular service because I hopped into Comcast.com's chat room because it was like Saturday afternoon. I got a rep on the line pretty quickly. We were typing back and forth. He was very eager to help until at some point I became, what's the worst thing that could happen in this situation? You know OK, so that's pretty bad. But in this particular situation, maybe it's not the worst possible thing, all things considered, but my goal was just to opt out of this service. What did they do instead? Not sell me something? Did I hear it over here? Not sign me. OK, they just disconnected my service altogether, which was, OK, for me, at the moment in time when I was trying to do work on the weekend, worst possible thing they could have done when all I'm trying to do is get rid of these slightly annoying but really not fundamentally problematic uh, advertisements. So the irony, of course, is that I'm chatting with the com uh, Comcast person by way of what technology? my cable modem, which has just been disconnected. So he's sort of off the hook. I am now up a creek because I now can't get back online. So then I get on the phone. And of course, you get the dial, to, uh, the little uh, on hold music. Your whole time is 20 or more minutes. So that was a little exasperating. So Dan and I have these little uh, 3G uh, wireless modems that use Verizon. So I hopped on that instead, started uh, chatting with some other representative. I thought I would hedge my bets here, and I also was simultaneously on the phone. Um, ironically, they both picked up at the same time, which was kind of awkward because I was pitting the two against them, each other, trying to see who would actually fix this problem first. Finally, I got disconnected from my Verizon connection, so there went that avenue for help. I'm still on the phone with the Comcast representative. They spout something about how the system was not quite right. I was in their, uh, this is how they appease the, the non-technical folks, I was in their wall garden. This is supposed to me make a nice sort of buzzword for I was walled into some garden. And this is their non-technical speak for I didn't have internet service. Anyhow, I finally got my internet service back. But of course, to opt out of this, they have to escalate it to someone who has still not gotten back to me. So, Anyhow, we can probably cut that part out of the video. It wasn't particularly educational, but it is germane to this whole issue of DNS. And it's actually worth noting, and we'll talk about more of this later in the term when it comes time to discuss security, that if your ISP clearly knows what websites you're looking for, misspelled or otherwise, so in fact could anyone that's sitting between you, point A, my laptop here, and point B, the rest of the internet. So again, we'll talk about this later in the semester, but DNS queries offer ridiculously vivid insight into what your actual browsing behavior is because you can, if you see this kind of traffic that's going across the wire, if you look inside one of those envelopes like Alex could very well have as it reached him a router, you can certainly see most everything that all of us are doing online. So it's just another venue into what's actually being done. Yeah? So quite true. So Dan points out that, and actually as happened here, these various packets all took different routes. And so that actually might mitigate this concern to some extent, because with some probability, that one bad guy is not going to be the recipient or the eavesdropper on all of your packets going through that particular router. In reality, packets do often take the same route, certainly with a narrow window of time. But if your adversary is simply some you know, snooper sitting next to you in Starbucks and therefore is within range of you wirelessly, the same concern would absolutely apply. But there's this interesting takeaway, too, from this idea of dropping packets. Sometimes, so the whole, uh, the, this line, protocol we described last week as being called TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol. It's um, a more sophisticated technology than we need to get into for today's purposes, but one of its most salient features is this feature of retransmission, which is to say if Dan tries to send that message to Mark and he sends four of those packets and they don't all get through, this protocol, TCP IP, which all of us use every day on the internet, is supposed to retransmit that same packet so that Mark actually gets all four pieces. And in fact, even though they ar arrived in a slightly different order here, they are also uh, stamped with a number, one of four, two of four, three of four, four of four. So Mark's computer could, in fact, reassemble those all in the proper order. So this is a really good thing, because it means when you receive an email, 
for the most part, you receive all or nothing. When you pull up some website, you see all of the day's news, not just part of it. But there are some web applications, and that's the fo、uh, some internet applications, and that's the focus for today. Higher level uses of the internet, not so much how it works underneath, that might very well not want you, the sender, might not want Dan to bother resending packets. Can you think of an application that is you that uses the internet where you know forget it if I don't get the first time just forge ahead nonetheless and keep sending me new data? When might that actually be compelling? Spam.、Oh, hmm. um, Okay, for the spammers, that's actually a very valid point because what do they care if of their million emails, a few percent of them don't actually get through? Who cares about the small percent of people? Let's just keep sending out new spam. So that's valid. And what other type? So that would be an email application. What other applications? Yeah. Video streaming. Yeah. So video streaming. Now, before we spoil the answer, can you、uh, imagine for yourself why that actually might be useful? Not to bother wasting time retransmitting packets that get lost. So it might very well take too long. In fact, what would the symptoms be that I, the recipient of the movie or broadcast that I'm watching, be? Well, so it would just skip if I miss data. So there might be a quick blip in the video, or it might seem a little fuzzy all of a sudden. But if the internet connection is still decent and things pick up and forge ahead, well, maybe okay, I miss that split second, but I keep going. Otherwise, what would be the alternative? If internet video used TCP/IP or TCP specifically, well, what would be the implications if it had to retransmit? What would you, the user, experience? Yeah, so you would have to start the movie over, or you get that sort of infamous, you know, buzzword, buffering dot dot dot, buffering dot dot dot, which can be good because it can over, overall improve your whole experience. But it's a very annoying thing if every time a packet's lost on the internet. What Alex did there intentionally in this、uh, in this example is very, in fact, common. So you don't necessarily want all applications to stop. So this other protocol, so that you've seen the acronym that many internet applications continue to use, is not TCP but something called UDP. And so when someone is designing a new protocol, a new application for the internet, it's partly up to them to decide what kind of protocol to use to actually get data from point A to point B. And a lot of the video folks out there have gone with UDP. For precisely that reason, it's not a downside to skip packets. It's a feature to just forge ahead and let the user infer what that split second of video might have been. All right. So, it's important to realize that not every time that you're downloading a video from the internet, you're not necessarily using UDP. It's just the times when when you're trying to watch watch some li like live video, for example. Or another example might be voice over IP, where Uh, that's the technology that allows you, very similar to Skype, to be able to make a phone call using your computer over the internet. And in that case, it's it's very much live. You can't afford to wait、uh, for all of the packets to be guaranteed to be there. And it's it's acceptable if one or two packets gets dropped. Maybe it's a little bit of a, a blip, like David said, but really doesn't matter all that much. And so,、um, for for these sorts of technologies where you know being real time and live is absolutely essential. Then that's the sort of thing where you will see UDP. But even some very popular video sites like YouTube, for example, you might notice that it usually streams a bit first. That sometimes indicates that you are using TCP instead. So it's it's sort of a subtle difference to realize,、uh, but it is certainly something that is also important to、uh, take into account: is that we're not always using this technology called TCP. Now, sometimes we have、uh, servers that can do more than just one thing. So we might have Uh, YouTube servers, for example, that can that、uh, can give us video and web pages. But then there's there's a number of servers、uh, where they are designed to do quite a bit more. So let's say you have a company, a small company, for example, and your company has a website. But your company also needs access to say email and to some other services that allow people maybe to log in remotely or some do some other things like this. We have this additional concept in 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 both of these protocols in the IP protocol. That allows us to have a server, to have one computer, really, that can do more than just one thing at a time. In other words, it can have more than just one service running from this computer. So, in other words, before we introduced this concept of having multiple services, if I tried to communicate with the server and I asked it a question, let, let's say,、uh, "Oh, I want to fetch my email," but this server doesn't do email; it only does, say, web pages, then. There might be some confusion, right? It may not understand what you mean. It may not know how to be able to respond. 
So there's this additional concept of something called ports that allow us to specify what service can run on which port. So there's some very common, and these ports are usually associated with numbers, or they're always associated with numbers. And usually when you make a connection from your computer to another server, to, uh, to just any other computer on the internet, you're communicating through uh, these, these ports. So for example, when I go to a website like computerscience1.net, I am communicating with that server on that server's port 80. So there's a variety of, of services and uh, servers that will give you different, um, or, or there's a variety of ports that will give you different services depending on which one it is. And there's, these ports, um, over time, they've, they've come to be associated with certain numbers. So uh, 80, for example, is almost always uh, an HTTP server, or in other words, a web server, which allows me to contact it and make and request a web page, for example. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that when you're contacting a server on port 80 that an HTTP server has to respond on that port. But what's important here is to realize that we have on every server, so every server has its own IP address. Every computer on the internet has its own IP address. And each computer may be doing more than one thing at once. So just as an example for your own computers, you're doing more than just surfing the web. You're also checking email. Maybe you're communicating on IM. You might be doing some other web services as well. And each of these have to have their own port so that this traffic doesn't get intermingled and sort of confused. And so this is what I'm talking about when I'm referring to ports. So port 80, when my computer contacts computerscience1.net, it's finding out the IP address of that machine through DNS. And then it's saying, OK, I, I will contact that IP on port 80 and ask it to send me a, uh, a web page. But there's some other common ports as well. So for example, um, you might see, so email is, is somewhat complicated because there, it now has many ports. Um, but 25, for example, is used frequently for, um, for email. And some other ones might include um, 443, which is HTTPS. Uh, so realize the difference here between HTTP and HTTPS. What is this S? do for us. Yeah. yeah, so it's secure. So whenever you're contacting, say, your bank's website, for example, and you see the little padlock icon, or you know that it's, it's secure in some way, usually that connection doesn't happen through the unsecure port 80, but instead happens through port 443. And um, can I grab the computer from you? Uh, it's yeah. annoying that we have to share this. It's like the class time share. Yep, exactly. Um, OK. Man, what have you done with this thing? All right, let's see. Uh, display mute. So when I visit computerscience1.net, I can usually just go to that specific website. But if I also try to figure out what that IP address is, so let's see, host computer science onenet Oops. What is it on Windows? And yep. All right, so I find out that computerscience1.net has an IP of 64.131.79.130. But what's interesting is that I can also type that number in. Oops, 64.131.79.130. What? Sure you want to hit enter? Why? Oh, you're right. OK. Oh, that's annoying. All right, let's do a different one. Let's do Demo there's going to be going to work. But no, that one's not <laughs> going to work for uh, CNN works for reasons that uh, we won't get into right now. So CNN, for example, this was the example that we were giving last week. They provide to us a variety of addresses. So this one is 157.166.226.25. So if I hit enter, it will take me to CNN. And so all I've done is I've just circumvented this DNS system. But what I can also do is specify a port. I can tell it that I know that there is a web server running on this computer, you know, this computer's IP address on port 80. So by typing in a colon in, in our web browser and then the port number that I want to try to contact, you'll notice that it also takes me to just CNN.com. 
And so this, um, for, this works through a variety of ways. And so you could actually run an HTTP server on your own computer. You, it's probably not a good idea to run it on port 80 because most of the time um, Comcast or these other ISPs actually try to detect if you are running a server on these ports and they'll shut you down. It actually happened to me a long time ago before I understood most of what was going on. That was embarrassing. I was still living at home with my parents. This was in high school. And then they shut down the entire internet telling me that I violated their terms of service. I had no idea what I was doing. So anyway, don't run your web server off of port 80. But what you can do is you can tell your web server to run off of some very, very high port number, for example. And then you can just contact it by using this colon and then port number um, uh, convention. All right. Yeah. Mark? Uh, Yes, these are port are they, numbers. What's their significance? So their significance, they allow multiple services to be run on one computer. So for example, we could have one server that's running all of these different services. So there, there could be one machine somewhere that, that not only serves web pages, but is also responsible for checking email, for example, and is also responsible for serving secure web pages. And so having different port numbers allows each of these services to operate individually on the same computer. Yes? Is there ever like a point to doing it that way as opposed to literally typing in what you're looking for? Like is there an advantage by doing the IP address and that port number as opposed to? There's not really an advantage to typing colon 80 because all of the time when you're using a web browser and you type in an address that has HTTP, it assumes, because this is the convention, that you mean port 80. So behind the scenes, what's happening is that this, this computer is looking up the IP address and then contacting that IP on port 80 automatically. The only time that it's advantageous is when, like I said, you're running a web server on a non-standard port. You're running a web server not on port 80, but some other number instead. Then you would have to type in the colon and then that port number to be able to tell my computer when I'm contacting the remote server that there is a web server running. It's just not on port 80. It's on this other port instead. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are they just blocking that IP from every single possible internet service provider? Yeah, most likely what China's doing when they're blocking um, when they're blocking services is they're just doing something like what we did here. They might say, okay, well we want to block, say, Facebook, for example. So they might do they might find out what um, IP addresses Facebook is running on, and then they'll say, okay, we're just going to block all communication to these IP addresses. So like what we were talking about before, where all of these packets are getting sent through these routers, there's probably a machine somewhere where these packets are going through. They look inside, say, OK, is this packet destined for one of these IP addresses? And if it is, they just drop it. They just destroy that packet. But they do it for all of the packets. So uh, Facebook doesn't have the chance to say, OK, I, I'm missing part one of four. They just don't get any of them from you. And little quiz review, what was, the techno what was a technology that can very well allow people to circumvent such filtration as that that we discussed? Proxy. Okay. Proxy. All kinds of things. And it's actually not, like, I haven't been able to go out through VPN or firewall or, you know, use Internet Explorer or anything like that. Yeah. Because it's just not how you get jobs. Well, no, I'm sure. But, and that was one of the buzzwords, right? VPN, virtual private network. If you are in some company or if you are in some country that is doing this kind of filtration, if they do allow data to go out via some IP addresses and via some port numbers, as Dan's been describing, if you have the know-how, you could certainly create one of these tunnels using a proxy, using a VPN per last week, and just route all of your data inside of that connection so that if your connection is between you and, say, Harvard University, well, Harvard knows uh, certainly what you, it is you are doing. But if all of that data is encrypted, no one else between you and Harvard should know what's going on. But certainly, could you filter out VPN traffic and the port numbers that it uses? Um, so it can certainly be tough. OK. Oh, there's a question here that I. Yeah, so 80, um, the port number? Mm -hmm. It's 
it's uh, by default, it's the same thing. So it's somewhat redundant by convention to say HTTP colon slash slash something dot com colon 80 because the default port number for this protocol, this language known as HTTP, which is the language that web browsers and web servers use to communicate back and forth across the internet, the default number for them is 80. So it becomes germane, particularly for web developers or for companies who for various reasons might actually want to run uh, certain services on non-standard port numbers. In fact, some of you, if you work for companies, might have noticed that sometimes your URL is something com colon 8080. 8080 is a common port number that people use for other web services. Um, but in short, it's not necessarily um, germane to typical web usage. But those of you who might have, actually it is germane even to the home user. So one of the things I do with my own computers is I use something called screen sharing on my Mac or something called remote desktop on my PC at home. These are technologies that come built into Mac OS and Windows these days. Linux has an equivalent as well that actually lets you connect to your computer remotely. And you can actually see your screen, move your mouse, remotely um, even if you're not inside of your home or your apartment. But the problem is almost all of us for our homes or apartments have what device in between us and the rest of the internet. So you have a firewall, you have a router access point. We can slap any number of labels on it, but the point of that device that's between you and the outside world is for the most part to let your data go out, but not let arbitrary data come in unless you initiated that connection. But now you have this catch-22. If you're on the road, you're working, you're on campus, and you want to connect to your home computer, you need by nature to initiate that connection from the outside world inward. So one of the things that people have to do in just their home setups these days is you go through your various setups for your home router, which might be running Apple's airport utility if you have a Mac setup, or might be going to like 192.168.1.1 in a web browser to configure your router. And it's called different things in different routers, but usually there's a screen that allows you to configure something called port forwarding that allows you to say, you know what, if someone's trying to connect to my home computer and they are using this protocol, this language called remote desktop or this protocol called screen sharing for a Mac, let that traffic through and specifically route it to this computer inside of my home network. So even in my own home, I actually have to assign my computer's IP addresses manually because I need to know reliably that my PC is this IP address, my Mac is this IP address, because if I want to filter or if I want to do this port forwarding of incoming numbers going to specific computers, you need to know these kinds of details. But that too is just generally fairly simple these days to manually configure your computer with a uh, static, as it's called, IP address. So even though this might be arcane to sort of typical users, as soon as you need to do anything slightly interesting in your own home, it becomes relevant. Those of you with TiVos or similar devices, if you want to be able to connect to those remotely, or sling boxes or Xboxes sometimes, if you want to be able to connect to these devices remotely, you very often have to know a little bit something about how TCP and UDP and IP actually work. So we plucked off one of these port numbers, 80, which is the default one for uh, web service. Why don't we look at something that's perhaps so familiar, it might seem a little dull at first, but see if we can't tease apart some of the technical highlights of this uh, application, this service we know as email. So first, what do we mean by a service? So the internet, per last week's lecture, is really a physical infrastructure. It's all of the computers and routers and wires and satellites and all of that stuff that makes up what we call the internet backbone, all of those interconnections. So the internet is a physical thing. The World Wide Web, by contrast, email, by contrast, instant messaging, by contrast, are not physical things. These are applications or services that run, if you will, on top of the internet. They use the internet to get data from point A to point B, but these are services with which humans interact directly via a computer, a desktop or a laptop. So email is one of these services that's been around for years. It is certainly among the killer apps of the internet. And to get data from point A to point B using email, you use an email address. So let's pluck off some easy things, but see if we can't fill in some gaps for some folks. An email address typically looks like this. Username at, and then we'll call this domain. Dot, what do we call this thing at the end? T T yeah, TLD for top level domain. And a TLD that we're familiar with is .com or .edu or .net. And we saw on GoDaddy's site last week a whole bunch of other options. So what are the constraints when you're actually getting an email address? Well, first, the domain.tld, this is case insensitive. So if you write it in all uppercase, if you write it in all lowercase, it doesn't matter. But the convention, as you probably know, is to do what on the internet? 
All right, so all lowercase is just simply the convention these days. In fact, it's, uh, there are silly words for even things like this. If you accidentally or unknowingly are in the habit of emailing people with your caps lock key down, what is that considered to be the equivalent of? So shouting, right? So don't write in all caps. It's the easiest way to uh, show your hand that you really don't know what you're doing with a computer if you're writing emails in all caps. And it sort of doesn't, you don't even think twice about it. So don't write in all lowercase unless you want to be artsy or whatnot. But uh, all caps, not such a good thing. And this here, we'll toss the silly jargon out today. Uh, some people like to call this netiquette. But I think I only use this in a sentence once a year teaching this class, so netiquette. Um, but there, there are other forms of email addresses, not just username at domain.tld, but if you've ever emailed me at Harvard, what's my email address? Mailin at post.harvard.edu. So some of us, particularly in universities and large companies, have instead the form username at what we'll call a subdomain, dot domain. Dot TLD. Now, why might an entity like Harvard have these things called subdomains? Yeah? Sure. So to summarize, so different email servers, different email addresses for different types of people on campus. So I have post.harvard.edu, which is an alumni-oriented subdomain. There's fas.harvard.edu, which all of you obtained earlier this semester, which is for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. There's med.harvard.edu, law.harvard.edu. And this is a nice sort of feature of email addresses because it allows different people to organize different uh, servers and different sets of addresses. Now, it's slightly more annoying for normal people like us who just want to send an email because arguably this is a little longer typically than this. And in fact, um, not everyone in the world seems to be familiar with the reality that uh, email addresses can in fact have these things called subdomains. So I took this screenshot on my own computer the other day when filling out like a mortgage pre-qualification thing on Bank of America's site. I think I've scrubbed all of my credit information here um, with using Photoshop. But notice the red error in the middle of the page there. All right, so there was an error processing your request. Some fields may, not, may have been left blank or incorrectly filled in. Dot, dot, dot. Please enter a valid email address. So apparently, Bank of America, pretty damn large organization, assumes that all email addresses in the world are of the form john at aol.com. I, of course, just wanted to fill out this form, and so I provided my email address, mailin at post.harvard.edu. Rejected, 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 every time. Um, now, Ironically, I don't go to MIT, but I have an MIT email address that's mailin at mit.edu, so I simply use that one ultimately to fill out the stupid form. But this is representative not so much of a technology limitation, but rather a stupid mistake by a programmer who wasn't thinking or who um, isn't aware of the fact that not everyone has something at domain.tld these days. So you can, in fact, have even more subdomains. But increasingly, would it get annoying, I think, if people had multiple subdomains? But this is an example of a programming mistake. And later in the semester, we'll talk about programming and what it means to write a bug. And this is representative of a very simple, if not obvious, mistake that someone might make. It's simply human error. But certainly very frustrating, especially if you're sort of more of a normal person who only has has one email address, this is kind of a deal breaker if you can't so much as fill out a form. It's not the first time this has happened. So questions about just the format of these things before we forge ahead with things more technical still. So let's toss out one FAQ. What does it mean to BCC someone? I know this is a bit of a, a, new, a newbie question, but let's get it out of the way and then look at some things more arcane. OK, blind carbon copy. And what does that mean? If I am sending an email to Dan and I BCC Alex, what does that mean? OK, good. So I'm sending that email to Dan and to Alex. And what do each of them see? So Dan doesn't know, exactly. right? And so BCC is wonderfully useful for a couple of reasons. One, you just kind of want to let someone know without disclosing to Dan that, hey, Alex is being CC'd on all of our private correspondence this semester. Or two, sometimes it's just a courtesy where you don't want, there's a lot of newbies out there too who like to hit reply to all. And maybe Alex really doesn't care what Dan has to say in reply. And so I'm kind of saving him, just a convenience, the uh, likelihood that Dan might actually reply to Alex and me and therefore clutter his inboxes. 
process. So it's actually done for a couple of reasons, but certainly I think the first one is the most common. Is there any way Dan can know that Alex has been BCC'd? Because right, this is kind of an important detail if you're relying on this technology to kind of let people know what you're up to. Yes, stupidity is pretty much the only way that can divulge the fact that Alex has also received that email. And it actually happens, right? There are people, and I, I shouldn't say their names on camera, that I never BCC them uh, on emails because I know they're not going to be paying attention. They're going to hit reply to all, and then I look like a jerk. Um, so you have to kind of have that mental blacklist so that you don't actually do that to those people. But technologically, if you actually look at the email that I sent to Dan, even if you're a super elite hacker that's looking at the very bits that comprise that. Uh, that composed that email, you're not going to see any mention of Alex's name. So what do we mean by these email headers? Well, let me go ahead and uh, toggle over here. I've been saving for the past few months a folder for E1 spam. Anytime I see an interesting piece of spam, I actually tuck it aside. I usually forward it to someone like Dan or other friends when I'm amused by spam. Um, but there's some interesting takeaways here. So I got this one here. Twitter is cracked. So have I seen this? Um, I'm not going to click this link because usually clicking links that you don't know what they are lead to bad things. Um, but this is not a very good email to click on for a couple of reasons. Why? What are the red flags here potentially? And how can you learn to be sort of a better consumer of emails, a safer consumer? What do you got? Or is there, are we in a room full of people who would have clicked this link? The address of who they send it to, computer. OK, well, so that's his name, Zaro, Zar which is some Gmail address. That's kind of like a nonsense Gmail address. But it's be, it was actually sent to Computer Science uh, 1 Discuss, an email list of the courses. So all of us on the staff actually got this spam. I'm probably the only one who read it. What's a red flag? The idea that there is no ask secure. What's that? Uh, okay, so that's a that's a, uh, a fair point. So there's no HTTPS, which means the link isn't secure. But the irony there is that even if that were a secure link, it just means you would be initiating a secure connection with someone you don't even know. So that actually wouldn't help us in this particular case. Yeah. Well, the name, if it's not in your contact list, it should show the, his whole email address instead of just the name. Yeah. So that's I mean that's one thing. In, you know, perhaps pointing out the obvious from us, but if you don't know the name. Maybe you shouldn't trust the content, especially if there's clickable content or worse yet, attachments. Right? And we'll talk more about this later in the semester. But these things known as viruses and worms are very often delivered to end users by way of attachments. And they're unknowingly double clicking on something they, they think they should actually be clicking on. So this, uh, this URL here, ctr.im slash hh, this is a new trend that's actually been popularized by sites like Twitter of URL shortening. Uh, URLs are, can be long, a few dozen characters, even 100 characters. And tweets, as you may be familiar in the Twitter world, are by nature very short things. So these things have gotten even more popular these days, where all of these services, dime a dozen these days, have come up in the world, whereby you paste in a long URL or a URL whose contents you don't want people to know on first glance into a website. You click Submit, and they give you a very shortened form of that address. And what happens is when a user clicks that link, whether using their Twitter account or just using their, win, uh, their laptop here, they click the URL. You're redirected to that URL shortening website. They then redirect you in turn to that original URL. So it's kind of a middleman, a proxy, if you will. But who knows? where we would end up. But the other warning signs here too, and I again don't mean to overemphasize the obvious, when you get an email from someone you don't know and there's an exclamation point in the subject line trying to entice you to do something, odds are, honestly, the heuristics are as simple as this. You should not do it. Another heuristic, let me dig up another random one here. Uh, I think it's uh, this one here. This is a fun one. So, dear user of the FAS Harvard EDU mailing service. So, this is such a stupid heuristic, but it works like eight times out of 10. If there are typographical errors in the email, eight times out of 10, I will come up with an arbitrary statistic spam, right? Sent from someone who you know, chose to send out a million emails but did not spend the moment to proofread any of those million emails. And this is such a common thing, especially since a lot of spam does come uh, inter from international uh, origins. Um, English might not necessarily be a forte there. And so it's actually a useful heuristic to exploit when trying to decide, should I do what this person is saying? Um, and certainly, it should go without saying. And there's an article 
on various websites every year about someone who's lost their life savings to someone in Nigeria or the like, uh, do not send money to people who've asked for it via email. No notes? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. One more? All right. Let's take a look here. Uh, oh, and actually, this one was clever. And this one's a bit more sophisticated and does speak to uh, the kinds of things we've been talking about today. So this was sent from one of our teaching fellows uh, earlier this year. This is a link in blue up top that actually looks, oh, that actually looks legit for just a moment. It was sent uh, to me. I'm a fas.harvard.edu user. Notice the URL actually starts with fas.harvard.edu. That might lower my inhibitions here. And I might be more inclined to click this link. But look a little closer at the domain name. What is the domain name really? Yeah, whatever the hell that is, .ikuu8s.net. I mean, that's just like the only domain name that this person found was available. And this is one of the other things you could do with DNS servers. This is a DNS trick that's perfectly legitimate technologically. This person has bought for maybe $10 ikuu8s.net. They've signed up for web hosting service with someone for a few bucks a month. And they've configured that service's DNS server to also resolve any requests for anything, foobarbaz.ikuu8s.net. Anything that ends with I, I can't even remember it, ikuu8s.net should resolve to that bad person's server. So again, you being sort of the unsuspecting user, you're looking for simple heuristics. You learned in Computer Science E1, don't click links unless you recognize them. Oh, I recognize this one. Not quite. You actually have to look a little closer. And there's yet one more trick still. Um, if, we fa if we scroll down in this email to the original email that was received by this particular teaching fellow, uh, notice that the link here, in fact, in blue, right here, actually leads to where? Actually, is that legit there? Let's say. Yeah, OK, I can't quite mimic it here for screen size. But the other trick you can do when you send emails, and we'll talk about this too in our website development lecture, there's this language called HTML. It's the languages that web pages themselves are written in that you'll learn a little something about in a few weeks' time. The thing is, when you know HTML, you can actually provide the world with a URL, a link that says one thing but actually leads somewhere else. And so another heuristic, and it won't work with this particular email client I'm discovering, is another heuristic you should use is hover over the link without clicking. And almost always in your programs, whether you're using Outlook or some other program, you can see what the actual URL is by looking in the bottom left-hand corner. Or sometimes like a little yellow sticky will appear telling you what the real URL is too. And this is just another way that folks are trying to trick on people like us into clicking links. And why? Who cares? Are they just screwing with us? Or what are these destination links usually all about? So stealing your identity, right? You, the world abounds with articles about people who have clicked links like this. And actually, they then get led to a site that looks quite like bankofamerica.com. But you know what? Any website that's out there on the internet, if I want to make a copy of Bank of America's website, at least their homepage, and you'll learn how to do this later in the semester, not for this purpose, but you can view the source code of a web page. This is that language called HTML. Might look a bit like Greek, and you won't have to write nearly this much by semester's end. This, of course, is a big website, CNN.com. But I can literally highlight that copy it, and then create my own web page just using a simple word processing program. Hit paste, save it with a file extension, not of .doc, but of .html or something like that. Upload it to a server somewhere, just like you will do. And voila, I now have a home page that looks just like CNN.com. And so this is another way that these things called phishing attacks, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, are often designed. A phishing attack is, I think the word comes from this idea of trying to bait people into doing something that they think is legit but really isn't. You, uh, it's social engineering. You try to trick them into doing something like log into bankofamerica.com. But it's not really bankofamerica.com. It's actually my website that I made to look like bankofamerica.com. And the moment this unsuspecting user types in their username, password, hits enter, what do I, the bad guy, go off and do? I go to the real bankofamerica.com, transfer some money, and I'm done. Go somewhere on the internet. A question came up over here. No? Should we take our break? One You're anecdote. Winning. So nope. actually, um, sometimes though they actually do want to just screw with you. Like for a couple <laughs> of years ago, there was this email that was going around that said in the subject uh, in the subject line something like, uh, "Oh, important! There's this new virus out, but there's an easy fix." And then the the email gave you these. 
uh, very clear, very concise instructions on how you could alter your system to make it safe against this one particular virus. The thing is that this actually had to delete a very important system file without you knowing it, and then the next time you tried to reboot your computer, it just wouldn't. And so my family has gotten into the habit because of a you know, very bad thing that they did one time. Every time they get a, a weird email like that, I always get called up and they say, oh, should I click on this link or should I do this or that? And I have to say, don't click on anything or don't follow any instructions that tells you to delete or do anything like that. You're just asking for a world of hurt. OK, let's take a five minute break. All right, so we are back. I was trolling through my inbox to find an innocuous email from Dan sent to me so that we can answer a question in the form, how did his email get to me? Uh, let's suppose the context is that someone has sent you an email. Maybe it's a belligerent email or an obnoxious email or just a random email, but masquerading as being from someone, but you think it's actually from someone else. Let's see if we can actually provide you with some forensic skills so that you can figure out with some probability who actually sent this email or where it came from. So I have this email uh, here, which is about, I emailed Dan about this thing with Mac OS and screen sharing for the very reason I described earlier. I was trying to set it up the other day. I happen to use Gmail here, and I don't know what email client Dan was actually using. But one of the features Gmail provides that almost any other mail client provides, whether via the web or client side like Outlook, is this option to show the original. A lot of these webmail clients kind of simplify things, often for the better, so you don't actually see all of the arcane headers, as they're called, that the servers use between points A and B. But if I click Show Original, or in Outlook, it's usually under View, and you go Show Options, you can see the headers as well. It varies, but poke around and you'll find it. This is the much more arcane information that pre uh, precedes Dan's actual reply to me. So if I scroll down, I'll see the same reply. So screen sharing and not remote management. So that was the topic of this email. It's pretty boring for, uh, for today's purposes, but let's look instead at these headers. So the headers are commands, essentially, to the server that instruct it who sent this email, what was the subject, what was the date of it, and what servers passed this email from points A to point B. And it's uh, chronologically backwards. So you want to look at the lowest header first, read upwards, and then you'll see, with some probability, the path this email took. So so the email Dan sent me here was sent to mailin uh, at post.harvard.edu. There's some stuff here called references and message ID. These are arcane details that the uh, mail clients use just to determine is this a unique message. Mail clients that thread emails, group them together if they're related, they use these secret hidden fields to actually recognize, oh, this is an email in that same thread. Um, that's not too interesting for us now, but here's Dan's from line. So it's from Dan Armendariz. Here's the subject line, RE sharing. And then it gets a little juicier. So this first line above his subject line is a received line. And there's some mention of, oh, that's interesting, 10.0.1.2. So it turns out that's one of those private IP addresses that Dan described last week that home networks use. 192.168.something.something is perhaps a bit more common. Apple hardware tends to use 10.something.something.something. But it's a hidden IP address, which means Dan's actually pretty safe where he is in his home or apartment or wherever he was, because public IP addresses can't reach private IP addresses. And he did also have a firewall in between him. But what's interesting here is that there is a mention of Comcast.net. So in fact, even though his computer's IP address was private, his computer, by nature of email, has to talk to the outside world. And as soon as it did, as soon as he did, by sending this email, he revealed to the world that, oh, that computer, yes, is behind a firewall, but that firewall is connected to Comcast.net. So that means Dan is apparently a Comcast customer, as a lot of us are in this area. So from there, though, it looks like his email was sent from his personal computer or his cable modem to outgoing.mit.edu. This must be some server that MIT manages. Makes sense, because Dan was sending from his MIT account that the email left his home, went to mit.edu, and then it went next to, looks like another one called mailhub.auth.com. Dot one, a dash one dot MIT dot edu. So it looks like MIT, it's a big place, got multiple mail servers. They're configured to bounce emails around to get it closer to the destination. Then uh, received from another uh, machine in MIT.edu. And then finally, it makes a hop down the road to harvard.edu, postmail dash something or other. And then from there, the last line reaches my own account, which I use Gmail behind the scenes for my post.harvard.edu account. So we can see from bottom up the path that this email actually took to get from Dan to me. So why is this useful? 
99 times out of 100, it probably isn't. And this is not common practice for me to even look at my own email's original headers because there's really nothing interesting there to glean. But it does let you, and you can certainly go home tonight and play with this just to get a sense of uh, how all of the stuff we've been saying last week in this really is true about data traveling across this backbone, going from points A to B, all these computers having IP addresses or host names, domain names, and DNS getting involved in between. And certainly have we both been asked, I think, at some point in our lives, you know, someone Someone's gotten a suspicious email or an email that doesn't sound like it was sent from someone. It looks like someone forged it. Forging emails is trivial these days. Um, you can at least garner some amount of information as to where this email came from, but not always. So Dan, it seems, because I was able to identify the source of that email as uh, uh, being in Comcast.net, um, it seems that Dan is using an uh, email client. He's using Apple's Mail client, which is a program with an icon that you double click and it runs on your computer, much like Outlook or Eudora or similar programs. And if you use those kinds of programs, you do, as we just saw with Dan, reveal a bit more information about you, which may be a concern, maybe isn't. If it is a concern, to be honest, you've been doing this for a very long time and most anything you do on your computer can be detected in some form. But if you're using webmail, for instance, had Dan logged into a webmail interface for his MIT address, or had he logged into hotmail.com or gmail.com itself, in other words, had he first connected to a webmail service, what I would have seen as the first point of origin in those headers would not have been his personal computer, but rather the IP address of what computer? the mail server he actually connected to, the webmail server that he was actually using. So if you are a bit concerned about this, a bit paranoid, it's nature that you're going to have to show your hand to Hotmail or Gmail or Yahoo or whoever. They know where you're coming from, but by convention and by uh, technical non-necessity, they don't disclose generally your own computer's IP address, so you get a bit more anonymity when it comes to covering your tracks or just not revealing your, your home network. Is there a big concern? Not really. If you're behind a firewall or even a you know ordinary router from the store, you know unless you have a determined adversary who's trying to get into your home network, there's probably really no threat whatsoever. Um, but for a modicum more of you know security, you can use a proxy of sorts or use these webmail servers as proxies of sorts for that reason. Any questions on headers or the like? Yeah. So if there was a question. Yes, so to summarize for the camera, what are, what are the red flags that you should look for to determine if this email was not in fact sent from Dan? Well, um, making, uh, so just to come up with a creative scenario, if I'd received an email per, uh, supposedly from Dan Armendariz, but I was suspicious, it didn't sound like the way Dan normally writes, and I looked at those headers, and I saw no mention of any of MIT.edu's mail servers. I just saw some random domain, another random domain that's bouncing this email between uh, them and me. I would see Harvard, because if it reached me, you know, I would see Harvard, and it reached Gmail, and so I would see Gmail. But if I saw no mention of MIT, I would think either Dan is using his laptop on some random network, maybe at some hotel or some internet cafe or the like, or someone has simply forged an email from Dan Allen at MIT.edu. They're using their own mail server or some uh, free compromised server on the internet to send that mail, and so at least it would give me a little more data. It's not going to tell me one way or the other definitively, but it can at least raise or lower my suspicions. Other questions? All right. So this was actually um, pretty interesting, especially a couple of years ago. Not, it's not as much of a problem now because people tend to be using a lot of Gmail and a lot of webmail clients. Um, but for a few years, people were really using the, the clients on the computer like Eudora or Mail or Outlook or a variety of things. And sometimes we, even in this class, would get emails from people saying, oh, I can't, um, I can't make it in because I'm writing to you from the Bahamas or something like that. You look at the IP address that they sent it from, <laughs> and they're sending from a computer on Harvard, on Harvard's campus. And, you, in, in, and it takes, you know, you have to have knowledge about these headers to be able to know what's going on. But this actually legitimately happened, was that people would, would email us saying one thing, saying that they were in one place, but their IP address revealed the false, the, or, you know, how, how false they were being about their statement. Yeah, don't lie to technical people. They'll catch you. In fact, one, one other comment, too, before we, we play a, a short video here that we've queued up. Um, so spam. How many of you get spam in your inbox every day? 
Oh, so it is a problem. So we don't really have a solution for you. Um, why does this happen? How are you getting spam? There's a, at least a couple different ways. And this will be our last topic on email. How'd you get it? Did you sign up for some mailing list? So, um, so cookies, not really. So not really. Uh, good answer to a different question that we'll come to. Yeah. So this is very common. So especially when you've signed, it is astonishing. If you sign up for a new email address, then you suddenly start getting spam, even though you've not even told your mother what your email address is. This is very common if spammers are just leveraging probabilities. They know that someone has an email service, gmail.com, hotmail.com, yahoo.com. They just randomly generate usernames. Most of us don't like to have really long usernames. Even mine is Malan, M-A-L-A-N. That's only five characters. If you're able to send emails pretty darn fast these days with a fast enough server such that you can send a million or more a day, well, it's not hard to come up with five million possible combinations of five English characters. And odds are, even though some of those might go into a black hole because those users don't actually exist, probabilistically, you might actually guess M-A-L-A-N at post.harvard.edu, and bam, I now get an email from that spammer. How else is spam sent? I get a lot of spam for one, and Dan too, for one particular reason, but we accept it as cost of doing business. Why? Our email address is on, all over the internet. Now, we have it on our own course's website, and we do try to raise the bar. We do some clever or you know, somewhat clever HTML-related tricks. We'll talk about that in website development. But we actually encode our email addresses such that you, the human, see the normal email address, but the computer would actually see a somewhat cryptic sequence of characters. Um, it's not going to stop a smart or determined adversary, but it does stop a lot of spammers who's just used web crawlers, scrapers, spiders, call whatever you want, just a program that crawls around the internet searching web pages for patterns that look like this. And every time it sees a pattern, it stores it in a database or a big Excel file or equivalent, and then uses that list to send email to people later. There's this um, caution that people inc uh, often give to others, which is if you receive a spam, and it even, or an unsolicited email, and at the bottom of it is an unsubscribe link, some people say, don't click it. Why would you ever not want to click the unsubscribe link? Exactly. If that sender has actually provided you with a URL that maps back to you somehow, there's a unique ID that represents you, or your email address is in the URL as a, as a parameter, as we'll call them in a few weeks' time, well, what you've just told that spammer, I exist. Thank you very much. You didn't send it to a black hole. So that person might actually end up sending you more spam. Now, with that said, if you're on some mailing list because you bought something at you know, buy.com and now you're getting buy.com stupid newsletters, odds are their unsubscribe link is genuine. And if you confirm visually that, in fact, this does go to buy.com, you hover over it and your browser or whatnot says, yeah, this is going to go to buy.com, odds are you can trust those kinds of links. But to be honest, these days, I think the statistic is scary high. 97% of email sent on the internet is spam. I mean, it's tragic what people are doing to this otherwise very useful system. Yeah? Can you go a little more detail about spam? Like, how much of it is, is all spam illegitimate? Like, is that all viruses type things, or? Oh, it's a good question. So what characterizes spam? So bunches of different things. Some of them, honestly, and this never ceases to amaze me, are just stupid. They say something nonsensical, but they don't have a link. They don't have a solicitation for money. It's just kind of nonsense. Often, I think you get those kinds of spams because the spammer is either an idiot or they're just testing their setup. And what better way to test their setup by just mailing millions of people if you're not quite ready to send them actual phishing type attacks, uh, sort of soliciting uh, URLs. Other spam, so spam by nature tends not to carry viruses, but that's not necessarily the case. A, a email message that we might call spam, spam is junk mail. And you can sort of define it any way you want, but it's junk mail. Sure, it could have some attachment that it wants people to click. It could have some scary URL that if clicked actually leads you to a website where you accidentally end up downloading a file. Could lead you to some pornographic site. It could lead you to some e-commerce site, some advertisement site, any number of things. Um, and sometimes spam is just junk mail in the sort of postal sense. It's just an unsolicited buy.com newsletter that I never actually wanted. And those, at least, are a little more compatible because you can generally unsubscribe. But your best defense against spam these days, and to be honest, I have 
no particular allegiance to, to them as a company. But ever since I switched to Gmail this past summer, my spam count has dropped to nearly nothing. And this is partly because, one, Google has a lot of smart people. And their spam filters are way better, I think, than Hotmail.com's ever were, frankly, um, objectively speaking. And two, because they are also simultaneously, ironically, such a huge target. I mean, what better corpus of users to email than millions of Gmail users? They also see all of this spam coming in. And they can realize, well, David David got this email, Dan got this email, Chris got this email, Alex got this email from some random email address, probably spam. So their size actually helps them. So honestly, if you're looking for a way out and you don't mind switching email providers, um, Gmail does a fantastic job, I think, of keeping spam out. It was enough to drive me away from my previous provider just because it wasn't good enough. I was getting five, ten more spams a day and it was just annoying. Now I get maybe one, if that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so I mean, let's say that you are a spammer and you have a million email addresses that you know work through a variety of methods like we were talking about before. If you email one million people and say even 0.1% of people respond or buy your product or do something like that, I mean, that's still, let's see, what is that, a thousand people. It's a lot of people that are responding to something that you just basically sat down and, you know, click send and, and it's very easy to get a lot of emails sent out and even with very, very small response rates you can still get a pretty decent amount of money. So frankly in terms of like that, in terms of e-commerce sites or some of these other sites where they're just trying to bring your attention to what to this new product or to whatever it is that they're trying to show you, usually it's 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 pretty good in terms of, of the raw hit rate. Like how many people will actually pay attention to it or fall for it, frankly. It really is a fascinating numbers game. And for, I think in the long term, this problem will be fixed technologically. Email was rolled out many years ago without really any kind of authentication mechanisms in place, even though there are some big companies like Google and Yahoo who are beginning to roll out uh, low-level technological solutions whereby emails actually get stamped with some kind of approval that, yes, this is actually from Yahoo.com. In the meantime, though, computer science is kind of the solution and the kinds of algorithms and uh, heuristics that big, smart companies like Google and Yahoo are actually using to just probabilistically detect spam. But the downside, of course, with these algorithms right now is that you occasionally get a false positive, which, is, which means what? Your email got dropped or it ends up in the spam filter. So even I occasionally, I have right now 4,000 emails in my spam folder, but even I occasionally go in there and just skim or search for certain keywords that a random spammer is not likely to know. I might Google, like, uh, I might search within my email for computer science because odds are most of my spams are not about computer science. And then quite often do I see, oh, an email that, uh, to be honest, a student sent two weeks ago and it just got plucked off for some reason. So it's a trade-off. A uh, question arose here. It's a good question. Um, why not charge for emails? So this has been proposed, especially in Washington and similar circles where there's perhaps not a perfect understanding of how the whole internet works, which is actually a perfect segue in a moment. Um, it's technologically really hard. Right now, I can think of a half a dozen ways that you can circumvent a system like that. All you need is one email server that is not adhering to this tax uh, type system, and you route all of your emails through it. Um, it would be really hard to orchestrate something like that. And frankly, I think it would definitely help with the spam problem, but it would also uh, really hurt people, too. Well, there's a financial argument where you, people would also revolt, I think, too. But I think the more damning argument is you roll out a technological protect, you roll out a policy protection like that, and there will be any number of technical people who circumvent it for people. That's actually a uh, perfect segue into something. So there's, so there's been this talk. You might remember a certain senator from a, uh, a couple of years ago named Ted Stevens who said some pretty interesting things about um, the Internet and about how it works, even though he was the, sort of the chair on the committee for technology or Internet or something like that. And yet he gave this speech in which, and we'll show it to you now, and, and, and it's, it's frankly just it's shocking the level of, of how much he doesn't really understand what is going on 
behind it. So without and, further ado. And I think it's worth noting as a disclaimer, especially to this audience, what's disappointing about the rev, uh, the lack of know-how he exposes of himself is not so much that he's perhaps an older gentleman who doesn't quite necessarily understand how some of these newer technologies work, but the fact that he was a decision maker who was actually making decisions based on technological things. So with that. Last week, you know, watching the program, we played some excerpts of Alaska Senator Ted Stevens explaining the nuances of the internet. And still is actually something that's um, been very relevant and has been on the minds of many people because of of this very thing that uh, they've been talking about is, is how can we route um, these, these specific packets or how can we give priority to certain packets maybe so let's say Google will now pay Comcast uh, to make sure that that all packets that are prioritized or rather that all packets that are destined for Google.com so whenever you do a Google search for example get prioritized to the top of the list and this obviously has some downsides as mentioned there but they're, they're always saying, oh, the advantage to this would be that, oh, now your Google searches will be faster than ever, but it's, it's you know, sort of give and take. Obviously, it seems to be sort of a slippery slope. If enough companies pay, we could eventually drown out all of the lesser people, or rather all of the people that, that just don't have the money to pay off all of these companies. And uh, luckily now, net neutrality seems to have died down a little bit in terms of, I think this was just a couple of years ago when uh, when this video was actually made. And now, luckily, they've come to their senses a little bit, but this is certainly a, a topic that uh, we have to continue talking about, and we have to make sure that it's in the, the forefront of our minds whenever we have um, senators with an understanding that is perhaps a little bit lacking uh, trying to propose things uh, like this, especially if they've been lobbied by some of these uh, very large um, companies. So we have, again, all of these packets, and they're sent from one computer to another, but we haven't really talked about really concretely about what exactly happens when you type in a web page on your computer, again, or rather a URL, like computerscience1.net, and you hit enter. So we know that there's a DNS lookup that, that goes on and that we try to contact then a, an IP address that belongs to, uh, or that we use that has a web server and that uh, through this web server we are then able to ask it for the web page. But we haven't talked about really this protocol, HTTP, what actually happens behind the scenes. So recall that we have to contact uh, this DNS server, we have to find out the IP address of computerscience1.net, then we have to contact this server on a specific port. So which port do we have to contact? Right, 80. So we're contacting this server on port 80, and we're going to send a specific request. And what we've been saying, what David and I have been saying this whole time is, give us a web page. Give us computerscience1.net. But that's not actually what happens behind the scenes. And it seems interesting to, be actually, to actually be able to see what happens behind the scenes when you are actually making this request. So rather than uh, doing computerscience1.net, because this one is, can actually be a little troublesome, I'll try going to CNN.com. So as we'll see now, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happened on this particular window. But we'll ignore a lot of this stuff. We'll just go up to the very, very top. Now the very first line says HTTP colon double slash CNN.com. This is the address that I typed in. Rather, I typed in CNN.com. But luckily, a lot of the web browsers now know that we mean this as a shortcut for HTTP colon double slash. In order for us to actually get a web page, we have to be syntactically correct and do the HTTP. Luckily, a lot of our browsers make assumptions for us and will automatically add HTTP before uh, the, the domain when we type it in. So I typed in CNN.com, and, it, and it's passing along HTTP CNN.com. So behind the scenes now, it finds the IP address, contacts that server on port 80, and then our computer sends a specific message to that server, and specifically, it is this message right here, and I apologize I can't zoom in to make it a little bit more clear, but it says uh, get, in all uppercase letters, get slash HTTP slash 1.1. So David will, my Vanna White will write this out for us very kindly over here. And what this is saying is that I want to get a specific web page that's found at slash. So why is there this slash that's right here? Well, right after the domain was the slash. So CNN.com slash, and that's it. I didn't have anything after that slash, and so it is just sending exactly what I want it, 
what I want to find out. Now you'll notice that there's some other information that's passed along as well. So in this case, it says host cnn.com. This is, in, it's, uh, I don't want to talk a lot about this, but basically one server could host multiple websites. So uh, the reason before that we were saying that visiting computer or typing in the IP address of computerscience1.net wouldn't work is because this server actually hosts more than just Computer Science 1. So if I just type in the IP address, I may not get Computer Science 1. But when I actually use, uh, when, I, when I, my web browser is sending a, uh, a request, it also knows to send the domain. So it says, OK, I want the website from CNN.com. But let's take a look at some of the other information that's passed along as well. So this next line here says user agent, colon. And then there's a long string of characters and a lot of this is actually kind of an interesting, but some of it is. And specifically, it says Mozilla slash 5.0 Windows NT 5.1 English US Gecko Firefox. So it's telling the server now quite a bit of information about me, about my computer that I am using to contact this particular web page. Specifically, it's telling it that it's a Windows machine. It's telling it the version of Windows that I'm using. It's telling me that I am, uh, I'm in the United States and that my language is English. And that's actually pretty useful because web pages might actually be able to respond with different languages depending on the country that you're in. But still, it's obviously sending along some extra data. And additionally, it's telling the web server what kind of web browser I'm using as well. So in this case, it's telling it very specifically that I'm using Firefox 3.5.7. And so every time you might have seen, uh, especially when doing some research for blog posts or even just looking around online, you might have seen these breakdowns about the most popular web browser. This is how they're able to figure this out. So big websites will sometimes publish this information and say, oh, about 50% of our users are using Internet Explorer, and 20% are using Firefox, and 10% and are using Safari, or just there's, the numbers are probably a little bit more skewed than that even. Um, but this is how they know, is that these servers can write down, can save this information every time you contact them. Um, so let's see, skipping along here, uh, some other information that might be useful is this, this line here, cookie. So um, I don't want to go into a lot of information about a cookie, but basically a cookie is just a little piece of saved information. So when, uh, when you contact a website, this website could ask to save some piece of information on your computer. And then every time you visit that website, this piece of information will be sent back to them. So in this way, they would then be able to figure out, oh, okay, well, I know that, that, uh, that this computer last logged into CNN.com, I don't know, like a week ago or even just a couple of minutes ago in the case of, of our demo right here. And they can figure this out because this piece of information can tell that to them. It can tell them so it basically tells them whatever they want to know. But there is some security behind the cookie. Like the server has to tell my computer what to, what to save. It can't just figure out any information. Like it can't read my documents. It can't read my emails or anything like that. It just is this very, very specific amount of data that's been sent back. So after I send this bit of information, after my computer sends this information, I get a reply from the server. And recall that the reply is sent over routers and packets and all that stuff is lower level. We don't care about that stuff right now. This is something that's happening on top of all that. And so the first line it says is HTTP slash 1.1301 moved permanently. And what it's saying is that CNN.com, there's no web page at CNN.com. The real web page is at a location called www cnn.com. So this actually a lot of uh, websites will choose one convention or another. It used to be that every time you went to a website you had to have www before that, that domain in order to get the website for it. That's not necessarily true anymore. You can really get a website if, if CNN decided to implement it they could have given us the website at cnn.com but it's usually almost a, a business or a marketing decision them to standardize their website and say, OK, always, whenever you show the website, make sure it says www.cnn.com. Now, some other websites might actually choose the opposite. They might say that we don't like uh, www, and they will actually choose to get rid of it by using the same sort of field. So realize that now my computer has been told that there's no web page at cnn.com, and it's elsewhere. 
So now what has to happen? So it's... So it's one of those ones that goes and gets it for directly? Well, it has to make another request. Yeah, it has to make another request, but this time to the correct location. So this time, it will resend the request, but this time the host will be www.cnn.com, and then from there it will send the same amount of information that it sent before, all of this junk that's here. Now it will finally get a response, HTTP slash 1.1, 200 OK. So realize that there's this three-digit number that's being, or this three, uh, or yeah, three-digit number that's being sent back from the server telling us some information, like 301 meant moved permanently, 200 means OK. And this is the one that's most common, perhaps, because this is every time you're visiting a web page and you get it successfully, it's 200 OK. But maybe you've seen some other three-digit error codes that, uh, that indicate some sort of error. What, anybody have any idea what those might be? Yeah. 404, 401, 403, all of these error codes that indicate something along the lines of the page is not found, you don't have sufficient privileges to view the page, or something else like that, is all sent in this protocol. This is, this is the underlying part where you're actually receiving this information. Yes? So there's, I, I mean, there's a difference between www.cnn.com and just cnn.com? Yes, there is. So um, each of these, so www.cnn.com, is actually, so it's a subdomain, right, because the www is subdomain of cnn.com, but in DNS, in terms of DNS, they are very unique. So each could actually have a different IP address. That's not necessarily the case here, but they could. So www could have a different IP address from cnn.com, could have a different IP address from some other subdomain that, that they might have, like news.cnn.com or something else like that. So they are considered to be unique entities. Every individual subdomain, every individual domain is a unique entity from the other. It just so happens that in this case, both CNN.com and www.cnn.com are handled by the same servers. And we actually take the opposite approach. So you may have visited computerscience1.tv where we archive old versions of the course uh, after each semester is over. We actually decided we don't want the dub dub dub. So users can visit www.computerscience1.tv or computerscience1.tv. And no matter what, we will then redirect them to be at the version without the www just because it's shorter in our minds. And we just wanted to standardize on some brand. And CNN, as Dan says, went the opposite approach. And most people go the opposite approach. So it's very much a decision that a, that a web designer would, would make at the time, or, or especially in the case of CNN, it's probably by, by committee or some, something ridiculous like that, where they have to make a decision about what do they want to be their default web page, like which is the one, like CNN.com, they acknowledge, they're acknowledging here that people will visit CNN.com, but they're saying, no, that's not right, you should be going to www.cnn.com. Now, what you're seeing here is, is a bit of a generalization because, excuse me, there's more data that's sent as well. So these are um, what are called HTTP headers. So just like we saw those email headers that, that dictate some additional information about the email that's behind the scenes, you generally don't see what's going on here um, unless you use a specific program like, like this to actually capture and record and view that information. But what's more interesting, this doesn't actually tell the computer what the web page is. But after this line, so this is the response from the server, starting at HTTP slash 1.1 200 OK. That means I got an OK code, so it will send me now the web page. And the web page gets sent, it's been truncated here, but it gets sent after this last header, this connection keep alive. And what is, so it was addressed earlier, what is this text that gets sent to us that our web browser is then able to make into a web page. So there's, a, there's something that gets sent to us. And, and uh, David showed it to you when he went to bankofamerica.com. Right, so the source. So there's something. So this is HTTP. HTTP is the protocol that allows us to retrieve web pages or to communicate with servers and retrieve web pages. But there's something else. So what the data that actually gets sent to us looks like this. It's just a bunch of text. And this text is called HTML. So it, this is just a bunch of text that tells the web browser what it should do to try to design or to try to actually create the layout of the web page, if that makes sense. And so there's, this is a standard that uh, 
it looks like a bunch of gibberish probably unless unless you've looked at it before and, and even this I mean this looks even worse but once you start to learn what some of these elements are and we're not going to we're just using this as a teaser really for the website development lecture uh, a few lectures from now um, but you will notice that there's a lot of repeat and there's a lot of stuff you just have to know relatively simple or, or few elements to be able to design a web page that's actually relatively complex. So let's see if we can now tie together this stuff from today to last week. But first, a random piece of trivia that uh, might as well get this out of the way. Um, this is a slash. This is a backslash. There is nothing more amusing, if not irritating, when even like commercial advertisements on TV or the radio have the Marketers say HTTP colon backslash backslash or uh, CNN.com backslash foo backslash bar forward slash. Internet uses forward slashes slash. You don't say forward slash. You say all right. I'm done with my little rant there. All right. So time to tie it all together. So there's been a lot of languages or protocols that we've been rattling off, and I think it's um, hard, certainly the first at first pass, to kind of understand where all of these pieces all fit in. So recall that last week we talked about some things called Ethernet, and Ethernet relates to the network cards, the physical cables and the jacks and the wireless technologies that you use. So I'm going to call this, uh, let's say, Ethernet. So this is my little computer here. Now, Ethernet's fine in your own local network, but the internet itself uses that protocol generally called TCP IP. So IP is internet protocol, and you have an IP address on your computer. That's the unique numeric address. So you can actually think of IP as being sort of a technology that sits on top of Ethernet. So Ethernet is really close to you and your personal computer, but when you actually want to leave your house, you kind of have to go up to a higher level technology that starts labeling all of the computers on the internet with these things called IP addresses. So I'll call this IP here. But then sometimes you want to use internet applications that don't just need data to get from point A to point B. They need to get there reliably, like web pages, like email, like instant messages, unlike um, video streaming software. So this is that thing called TCP. So often the world discusses them in one breath, TCP slash IP, but technically they're doing different roles. IP is a protocol someone came up with that just slaps addresses on all computers on the internet. TCP is the technology that says, you know what, if you're going to send from IP address A to IP address B, but it's got to get there, TCP is the protocol that watches what's going on on the internet when Dan sent through the envelopes through the crowd and notices, oh, a packet got dropped over there, let me retransmit that packet. And then finally, all of this to the user, so fundamentally uninteresting. All you care about is pulling up CNN.com or sending an email. You care about the application you're actually using. And if that application is a web browser, the language or protocol your computer is using to get real work done and send a request from browser to server to request the day's news or sports scores or whatnot, that's this protocol Dan's been describing as HTTP. So this actually, people like to number these things, 5, 4, 3, 2, and then 1 is generally the actual physical connectors and the physics behind it all. So this might be my computer just trying to visit a website. Now CNN.com or any website like it has one or more big fancy servers, but that fundamentally have the same kinds of technologies. CNN also has something like Ethernet or some other technology that physically wires all of their computers together. They have to support IP if they want to participate on the internet. So they have this kind of software built into their servers as well. They want to guarantee that I get my response and they get their ad revenue. So they too use this protocol called TCP. And finally, to actually serve up web content, they need a web server. And again, web servers and web browsers, by definition, speak this protocol called HTTP. And so they, too, must offer this. They must support this protocol. So finally, when you actually get to getting that real world work done, sending request for web page like Dan showed, this thing here with get and getting back the response, the language that's exchanged over the internet is another language still 
but it is sort of the intermediary, the language that server sends to browser that the browser then renders with all the pretty pictures and sounds and motion picture that constitutes CNN's web page. So if you've had trouble making, keeping track of all of these various protocols and how it all fits in, we started last week looking really at IP and Ethernet and a little bit of TCP. Today's been focused not just on web, but on email is layer five, and instant messaging is layer five, and all of the popular apps that you use wirelessly these days generally live at layer five, but hopefully this picture allows us to come full circle so that you can make sense of all these various technologies and how they fit in. Any questions then? What is the HTML? What is that? HTML is the language in which web pages themselves are actually written. So when I say, I being a web browser, get me slash and speak this protocol, the answer that comes back is a big text file filled with all of that stuff that looked like Greek to us today that is HTML that we'll all be writing in a few weeks' time. Yeah? One is the physical layer, so things like um, the physical copper wires or the wireless technology that's being used. It's lower level, and it's the physical world aspect. And it's generally, from a computer science perspective, less interesting. That's where the electrical engineers get involved. Other questions? So if you take nothing else away from today, don't click on, don't even read your email, perhaps, for a few days. <laughs> All right, we'll see you same time, same place next week. <laughs>